All right, so where have we gotten ourselves? Let's wind through the whole thing. We started with a Lie group G, and we know it's a Lie group, therefore we know we can define it in terms of coordinates, and we can consider the group element, the identity group element. We can map that guy right to the origin of the coordinate system, and the coordinate system will have eta parameters. So every element in this Lie group G can be defined by a coordinate of eta parameters. And what we can actually do is we can actually lean on this so much that we can think of the point, say the group element alpha, right? We can consider alpha as its coordinates, alpha one, alpha two, dot, 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 to alpha. And what number is up here? Eta, right? Because it's an eta dimensional manifold. So we now know that, and of course, therefore, this, because it's a manifold, it's obviously a topological space, and it is a group, right? So it has its group operation, which can act on alpha, two elements, alpha and beta. I guess I'll make a beta here, and beta goes there, and alpha goes there, and out comes another element, gamma. And all of these guys can be considered in terms of coordinates. In other words, you have alpha, beta 1 through beta, eta, and that'll equal uh, gamma. So I guess you could say you could call this alpha i, and it'll be the ith coordinate of gamma. Or you could just leave it in sort of the abstract and just give it the abstract thing where we understand that this this guy can be understood as gamma one through gamma eta if we want, right? The whole thing is, is that it's completely interchangeable, these group elements, these abstract group elements with their coordinates, right? So we've got that. Now, the other thing we're going to do is we're gonna say, okay, these group elements, they are also can be mapped into a set of matrices. Right, we are going to talk about, oh God, we are going to talk about each of these group elements as though they are each a matrix, right? So we have a matrix representation. And that representation will be an n by n matrix where that n can actually be almost any value. It's not always true that every Lie group that you can imagine, and there are limitations on these things that we'll eventually get to, but every, every Lie group has a matrix representation of every dimension. That's not actually true. But there are many different matrix representation dimensions that apply for every Lie group. So I could have one Lie group and a one by one representation, two by two, three by three, five by five, a million by a million. Um, but I pick one and I can create an n by n matrix representation of that group. Now this fact, the fact that you can do that uh, is worthy of a lot of thought, but for right now, we're going to take it as an assumption and we'll get back to it. But we will be, but we're interested. Remember, we started this whole story with matrix groups, right? And so these matrix groups are what um, are motive us, the classical group. That's what motivated us to get here. So we're now considering. Each group element will be understood in terms of its matrix. So what did this actually mean? Well, say we had an n by n matrix, then we had the first unit for say, say alpha, right? Alpha will be understood as alpha one one of these parameters, uh, um, the, these, these various, well, let's see, how do I do this? Uh, so it'll be alpha one one of alpha 1, dot, 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 all the way to alpha eta. And then you have alpha 2, 1 of alpha 1, dot, 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 to alpha eta. Then you have alpha 3, 1 of alpha 1, dot, 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 to alpha eta. And likewise, I guess, you know, you could go on till you get to alpha n1 of alpha 1, dot, 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 to alpha eta. And then, of course, this goes this way and down until you have finally alpha n n of alpha one dot 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 to alpha eta. Okay, 
So what's important to understand, of course, is that the dimensionality, which is in air quotes, of the matrix is n by n, but the dimensionality of the group is just eta because eta is an eta dimensional manifold. So each of these elements is defined by eta different parameters, right? And so now once we know that, let's see, how, 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 can, I, how can I get that to work? Once we know this, let me shrink this down. We now learned, let me shrink this down a little more. I'm going to put it right there. Then we learned, well, once we've got this, we know how, how to find the generators, right? And that will go, I see I'll do in red. That will lead us to the generators of what we're going to call eventually the Lie algebra, right? Today we're going to see why it's an algebra, right? Before we understood it as sort of a Lie vector space, right? I called it a Lie vector space, but I use that in quotes because nobody ever talks about a Lie vector space. We only talk about Lie algebras. Now algebras are vector spaces, so this isn't like insanely crazy. The reason I can't officially talk about it as an algebra is because all I've done is identified uh, a vector space basis, the generators. I, I told you how to do the generators, generators. And I told you that the generators formed the basis of a vector space that uh, was this, that was this Lie vector space. I haven't told you how to multiply generators together to create an algebra. Uh, we'll go into the semantics of the difference a lot in this lecture, uh, in this lecture, just in a moment. I'm just trying to catch up to where we were when we left. So we learned how to make the generators of the Lie algebra, and I will write those generators as x. Well, I guess you would do, there's one generator for each of the parameters. So it would be x alpha 1, uh, x alpha 2, you know, x alpha 3. But the way we really write that is usually we, we just number the generators x1, x2, x3, dot, 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 and you should have the final one should be x eta. So there's always the same number of generators as there are parameters. And so uh, how did we do this? What was our little formula? Well, if you have this, if you know how the matrix representation is written in this form, it's really easy. You just simply take the, um, uh, the derivative of the matrix uh, with respect to alpha i, right? I guess I'll write xi is the derivative of the matrix with respect to alpha i evaluated at alpha equals zero, evaluated at the identity. And um, when you do that, you're, you'll get xi, and then you just do this for each of the parameters, each of the eta parameters. So we've got this formula. And then what we learned is, okay, well, well, what does that do for us? Well, the matrix representation, this guy, is always understood as its Taylor expansion in terms of these generators. So we can always write uh, any of these, any member of this matrix, any member of this matrix representation, which say I'll call it, um, well, let's see. We will just, we'll go with this. We'll go with alpha is the exponentiation of the generator alpha i x i, right? With this is a sum of these alpha, the parameters that define alpha, right? That's these, that's the coordinates, right? The coordinates of alpha. And we exponentiate it. Uh, and we do this infinite exponentiation. So we, uh, well, we, we do this exponentiation. We demonstrated how that was done for one example in our last lecture. And we'll probably do, the, uh, Gilmore has a whole chapter that's coming up of just examples. So we'll be going through a lot of them. But we understand that any finite element of this group or any finite element of G, we can find its matrix representation by this formula where these guys are calculated through this formula. Now, it's a little bit backwards, right? Because in order to calculate these, we actually began with a well-understood formula for the matrix. 
So the point is, is we can recover a formula for the matrix using this process. What's interesting is you don't always recover the same formula. Once you find these elements by taking these derivatives and then you just uh, exponentiate them, so the formulas you end up with for alpha are not necessarily parameterized uh, exactly the same way. It's ultimately equivalent, but it doesn't immediately roll back to the what you started with necessarily. But uh, it's all it's still a completely good representation of the matrix. So uh, then what we understood is, all right, so we've got these generators and this vector space. So we know that if we've developed these eta generators, we know we can always create another generator by writing alpha i x i, and that will so we can always create a generator um, by through a linear combination. So that was important, and that's what allowed us to call this a vector space, right? And then we realized, well, you know, I can take the identity element plus any generator. So now we'll call any generator, well, I, uh, with a, as long as I have a small number, then I can take any generator, which I guess I'll write alpha i x i to reflect any generator in the space. And this guy, as long as epsilon is small enough, that actually equals an infinitesimal, an infinitesimal, um, an, a group element that is infinitesimally close to the identity. So that's some guy that's in this infinitesimal neighborhood around the identity. But What's important is this represents that infinitesimal nearby element inside the group or inside this matrix representation of the group, right? Because this is going to be your identity matrix, and this here is going to be an n by n matrix uh, with this tiny little parameter in front. So this is actually going to be inside the group. And, uh, and as such, that's what allowed us, by the way, to do this exponentiation. Right? We were able to do this exponentiation because we could multiply group elements together. And when we were doing that, we were using the multiplication rule of this, which is simply matrix multiplication. That multiplication does not exist in here. This is really important for today's lecture. Multiplying two infinitesimal group elements is multiplying them in here. All right, well, there was a pretty quick, pretty quick review. Um, trying to think if there's anything else we should cover. There was this whole part about the uh, geometric space, right? Notice how we're not really interested in the geometric space so much right now. We're dealing more with um, the group acting as its own geometric space. Uh, we'll come back to the subject of the geometric space. We're going to show an equivalency between all of these things. But right now, we're interested in we have the, the abstract group, which is represented by a matrix group. And that matrix group, if we understand it, we can quickly get the uh, uh, generators of that matrix group. And from those generators, we can reconstruct, well, we can construct what we're going to be calling the Lie algebra. And from the Lie algebra, we can reconstruct the matrix group through exponentiation. All right, so now, Let's move on a little bit. So let's focus right now on our Lie algebra slash vector space and the matrix representation of the Lie group. You know, we can write this several different ways, right? Sometimes you can say um, uh, M of G, where G is the actual Lie group and M is a mapping that takes the Lie group to a matrix. Some You'll see a lot of books do that. Sometimes you just call this thing because that mapping is an isomorphism it doesn't hurt to just just call this thing g but now understand everything in here is a matrix i think um i think we'll do that and let's see i'll throw down in the matrix group the identity right i'll call the uh, this the identity matrix and then what we're going to now do is we're going to look at something from group theory from group theory called the commutator. Now the commutator is a concept of group theory. And as such, it is uh, a pro it's it's a um, a property of two group elements, right? So if I have a group element G1 and another group element G2, 
the commutator of G1 and G2 is the product of G1 and G2 multiplied by the product of their inverses, right? And this ultimately, if G1 and G2 commute, right, then obviously this would equal to G2, G1, G1 inverse, G2 inverse, and then this would just be the identity, and then that would just be the identity, and this whole thing would be the identity. So if, if G1 and G2 commuted, its commutator would be the identity. However, if G1 and G2 do not commute, then its commutator is not the identity, and its commutator is some other element of the group, you know, G, maybe I'd call it 1, 2, or something to indicate that it's the commutator of 1 and 2. Or give it some name to reflect that. So it shows if this thing is not the identity, then G1 and G2 don't commute. Now, if the group is entirely commutative, then the commutator of any two elements will be the identity. But what usually is the case is that some of the elements in the group commute with each other's and others don't. Now, when we think about, as physicists, when we think about the commutator, we always think about, in quantum mechanics, we think about a definition that looks like the commutator of two things a, b is their product minus their product in reverse order. And of course, if that equals zero, then they commute. Now, this is related to what we're to this, right? That's an important point. But mathematically, this is the foundational idea. In physics, it seems like this is almost the foundational idea. But that's really backwards, in my opinion. We, so we'll get there and see how these two commutators connect, and that's the whole, really the whole point of, of today's lesson. So the way we do this is we think about group elements very close to the identity. So how do we construct an element of this matrix group that's very, very close to the identity? Well, what we do is we write down the identity, and then we take a very small number, and we multiply it by a generator. Now, this generator Y can be understood as uh, if, if this matrix group has a basis for its generators XI, it can be understood as alpha I XI equals the generator Y, all right? So we can think of it like that. Now, if epsilon is small enough, right? If epsilon is small enough, then this guy is gonna be within the neighborhood of the identity, right? And it's gonna be, uh, all the higher order terms we'll ignore, because it'll be, this will be so small, that this will in fact represent exactly an infinitesimal, uh, a group element infinitesimally close to the identity. So let's say that that equals G1, right? Then G2, likewise, will equal the identity plus some other small number, I'll call it sigma, and we'll call sigma uh, x, where now, well, I shouldn't use x, right? Uh, we'll call sigma z, where z would be, if you, if we must, z is, is a generator, and therefore z is beta j x j, is equal to z. I'll, this are definitions, so I'm going to give them three little equal signs. When it's when we're just defining symbols, you can use three. There's no algebraic content. The point is z and y are are elements of the vector space here, right? And um, uh, epsilon and sigma are considered very very small numbers. Okay. So now, how are we going to characterize g1? inverse, right? Now normally, if I was left to myself to do this, I would have gone i minus epsilon y, right? However, that's really not the way uh, this is typically done. The way this is typically done is we assert that g1 is defined this way, that this is exact, with air quotes, meaning exact in the sense of an infinitesimal epsilon. Therefore, we can get the inverse of this by literally looking at 1 over i plus epsilon y, right? <clears throat> so we're looking for literally the reciprocal of this thing, the, the, the Taylor expansion of the reciprocal of this thing. So, so how would that work? Well, 
uh, I think I'll do it on a separate screen. So this Taylor extension of this expression is we're taking epsilon x to be the small uh, thing, right? It's epsilon times x that's small. It's this times the general. Remember, these are all. This is a matrix. This is a matrix. These are all sort of matrixy. So here we set epsilon x equaling zero, and uh, if epsilon, then you just get one, which ends up being the unit matrix. The first term is you have to take the first derivative of this. So you get that negative sign, the square, but you set it to zero, and it ends up with just epsilon x with a minus sign. And then the second derivative takes away that minus sign, and these twos cancel, and you end up with epsilon x, x squared. So the inverse of 1 plus epsilon x is going to be this expression right here. And remember, x is a stand-in for any... Uh, element of this, this, oops, um, Lie al uh, algebra, right? This Lie algebra, the uh, the vector space as we're understanding it now of the generators. So, it's these are the expressions for I have for y and z. So, say we so now I'm going to substitute in for the inverse of this and the inverse of this. All right. And these are the substitutions. I, now, I know it looks a little strange. It always looked odd to me that the inverse matrices were taken to second order, but we leave the primary matrices at first order. But uh, you'll see that these two terms are actually going to be an important part of the cancellation. So we're going to use these four expressions to create this. We're going to create the commutator of G1 and G2 using these expressions right here. And again, I'll do that on another screen. All right, so here I put it all on one screen, right? Here are our four terms that we're going to multiply together in this order. That's G1, G2, G1 inverse, G2 inverse. Then if you take these two and multiply them together, you're going to get this expression here. And then these two give you this expression here. And uh, I just blew everything out. I started dropping third order terms and fourth order terms we ignore right so uh, I, I didn't I didn't even include them over here right but I did come there's a third order there's a fourth order term just ignore it there's a third order term just ignore it there's a third order term just ignore it there's a third order term just ignore it uh, uh, this is a third order term, but that should be a squared, and there should be a y there, but regardless, it's third order, so we get rid of it. And then there's a bunch that I didn't even calculate. So the third order terms go away. Um, but let's now see what else cancels in addition to the higher order terms, which don't cancel, but we don't we just ignore them. The, um, the linear terms actually cancel. The epsilon y with, uh, where's the other epsilon y? Here, those guys cancel. So there are no linear terms left. So everything that's left is going to be second order. So we see that the uh, the z squared term, oops, there should be a square there, right? There should be a square there because that's that's this guy with um, this guy multiplied together. So it's this one multiplied by this one is this negative z squared. So I'm not, I just... When I put it together, I didn't put the z squared, but regardless, it cancels. Um, there's an epsilon squared y squared and a minus epsilon squared y squared. And you can see where that would come from, right? The epsilon squared y squared comes from right here times i, and then the minus one comes from right here, right? So these guys cancel. And, uh, oh, there's a cubic term that goes away. And so what do we have left? Uh, then we have this epsilon sigma yz and epsilon sigma yz. Notice I was very careful to keep everything in order because these are not necessarily commuting. So then everything's gone with the exception of, let's see, the exception of this and this. And of course, if you look at that, that's going to end up becoming the commutator. I'll just uh, do it down here. It's going to be I 
plus epsilon sigma y z minus z y and then plus I'll just say all the higher order terms right but then that's just going to be i plus some very small number epsilon sigma times the commutator of yz where this is the commutator that we know it's defined to be this right so there we have it right so now what we finally found out is that in, with small epsilon and, and sigma this becomes a very small number and this now is the generator of an infinitesimal translation away from i so you might say oh well that if it's a generator of an infinitesimal translation away from i it must be a member of this uh, vector space right and that's true it is a member of that vector space but it's not evident from what we've done right it may very well be that we have found a infinitesimal uh, group element that is defined by an infinitesimal motion that requires something that's not in the vector space, right? We don't know that this product is in the vector space. Remember, the vector space doesn't have a notion of multiplication. If it did, it would be an algebra, right? It only has addition. So we have to prove that this guy right here is actually in the vector space. And that's actually not very easy. So we, I'm not going to whitewash it in the sense that most books just say, oh, look, this is an infinitesimal motion. Therefore, it is in the vector space that's spanned by the generators that we calculated using the techniques that uh, uh, I described earlier, right? So move, let's move on, right? And, and fair enough. You, know, you don't have to prove every little thing when you're studying the mathematical physics. I found this kind of like, wait a minute, how do I know that this is in the vector space? So I dug up the proof, and because I did it, you're going to have to do it. So um, let's have a look. All right, so this is how we're going to proceed. X will be a generator. So X is an element of this vector space that's spanned by the generators X1, X2, dot, 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 to X eta. So because it's a generator, it'll be, it can be written as alpha mu x mu, for example. Y will also be a generator, and likewise Y could be beta mu x mu, but we're going to call it Y. So those two things are generators. Now we now know that uh, any, the group element, uh, an element of the group uh, can be expressed as the uh, e raised to the power, say, alpha mu x mu, right? We did that in our last lecture as an example, and we'll do more examples of this as we go on. I, I kind of like that, that exercise. I find it kind of interesting, the Taylor series and the matrix multiplication and all of that. But now, uh, imagine that we take that, This is so this is a finite group element, right? A finite group element, say, G1, right? So imagine we take that finite group element and we throw in another parameter t here. And we say that t is in the interval from 0 to 1. So that when t equals 1, this group element is actually equal to g1. Well, I guess I need to change this. I guess I, should, I need to write this as g1 of t, right? And so when t equals 1, g1 of t equals the group element that is described by this alpha mu um, x mu uh, raised to the e. When t is 0, g1 is equal to the identity, right? Because then you, then you get, so g1 of 1 equals e to the alpha mu x mu, which I guess, what do we call that? We'll just call that e to the x, right? We'll just use this... Uh, this equivalence right here. And g1 of 0 equals the identity. All right. So understanding that, let's now create a few of these different of these group elements. Let's give them some names. I'm going to first of all, I'm going to call I'll, I'm trying to make it simple here. I'll call ux of t, right? ux of t 
is going to be e to the tx, right? So that's sort of a, I'm rewriting this. It's really no different than this right here, except g1 of t is now ux of t. As I want to make, I'm going to add a uy of t, and this x here is reflected up there. So then I can create uy, that better be a capital Y, right? U y of t equals e t y. Okay, so now I know that I can re I can recover. I can recover the uh, the generator by just taking this derivative when t equals zero, and I will get I will get uh, you know I'll get t. Oops. Sorry, I'll get x e to the t x with t equal to zero, which equals x, and likewise, and likewise for uh, for y. Okay, so with this in hand, this is now we've basically taken uh, a group that has mu or or eta parameters, right? Because the Lie group would have uh, mu mu from one to eta parameters. It's a Eta dimensional E group, and we've kind of boiled it down to one parameter. We're basically we've we forced this whole thing to exist on a line between the identity and the group element inside the manifold. So I guess if you plotted it in the manifold, right, R eta with say alpha one and alpha two here, here's the identity, here's the point alpha one, alpha two, right. We're, we're along that line where this is now u x of 1 and u x of 0, right? So you're always somewhere along this line. Okay, so now all you we're going to do is we're going to create a new group element. And this will be very easy to create because we'll just define it. Because remember, th this is a group element and this is a group element. Whatever t is, it doesn't really matter. Those are both group elements. So I'm going to create a group element called u of s and t, and that's going to be equal to u y parameterized by s instead of t, right? With the same rules, right? It's, s is just a placeholder. u x of t, and then um, u y inverse of s. I better write it, clean it up a little bit. So this is a group, right? So this is a group element. This is a group element. So the product's a group element. This is the inverse of that group element. So we just multiply them all together, and we get another group element, and we're going to call that group element u. I, pr I could have probably given this a subscript x, y, or something, uh, but uh, let's just leave it at that. All right, so now this is a completely legitimate group element. Therefore, therefore... Um, it is got to be written uh, in this form for something. There's got to be some generator or some exponent that can, there's got to be some member of that of our generator based vector space that can be exponentiated to give you this thing. So let's hold S constant, right? And then look for such a generator. So how would we do that? So we'll go d by dt of ust, right? So now we're just taking the teeth derivative of this thing. So this first one is the first one, the first term, uy of s is unchanged. The second term, uh, we'll take the derivative of that. Well, that's the only term that's derivative is taken. But by definition, that's just x, right? That's, the, oh yeah, we got to do this at t equals zero, right? Once you set t equals zero, you get x, and then you get u, y, inverse of s. So this guy, what's interesting here is this guy here is the generator of this group element, right? It is a generator of this group element with respect to t, right? That's what this is. So there's the generator of... Uh, that was associated with the uh, this x um, group element. 
but these are two group elements that you multiply it by, and yet that product, by its very definition, is, is an element of our vector space based on uh, the, uh, whose basis is the generators of the group. So now I know that this thing is er therefore a vector in this vector space. But now look what happens when I do this next step. I'm going to take the derivative with respect to s of this thing that I just made, whose derivative was with respect to t, right, when I set t equal to 0. Now we take the derivative with respect to s of this. And then this first term, it's going to be a product rule, obviously. The first term will be y. The second term is unaffected, and it's x. And then it's u, y, uh, inverse of s, and then it's plus um, uh, u y of s x, and then it's um, the derivative of this, which is going to be minus y. But then we remember to set s equal to 0, which means that's the identity and that's the identity. So then we end up with yx minus xy. Well, that's really interesting, right? Because now we have the commutator in there. We have the derivative of this guy uh, actually is the commutator. So, but have we really affected Made, made any progress. We've now shown that we've shown that the derivative of this is definitely an element of this of our vector space, but we don't know that the derivative of elements of the vector space are actually in the vector space. So we still don't know if this is in the vector space. So what we appeal to is now the definition of the derivative over here, right? And this is going to be uh, the, the step that makes all the difference. So by definition of the derivative, this is going to be u of s plus h comma t. Uh, my h is bad. s plus h comma t times x times u uh, inverse of, of um, u inverse, so I guess this is u y, u y inverse of s plus h. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on, that's not, that's, that's written poorly. Let me, let me, let me write it again. Okay, so uh, this is, this is it, right? So, this derivative here is the derivative by s of this object right here. Right? So there's no comma t. I had a comma t here the first time. So ui s plus h, ui inverse s plus h, x. That's this guy where I have my s plus h's minus the little s's without the h. Right. That's the definition of this derivative. h is going to be driven to 0. But remember, we set s equal to 0, right? s equal to 0. So if I set s equals to 0, then this goes away, that goes away, this becomes the identity, and that becomes the identity. So now what's going on? Well, this here, this part, right, is just with h in it, and we've already proven that this is an element of the vector space, right? We know this is an element of the vector space. Well, that's what this is here. With the s gone, we just have ui of h, x, ui inverse of h, which is really the same form as this. So this is an element of, of g, of g being the uh, vector space uh, uh, spanned by the generators that we calculated. Well, with this gone and this gone, we just have x. And x, of course, is a member of g. So now we have a member of G minus a member of G, 
which of course means this whole numerator is a member of G. And then we divide it by H, but H is a real number. But G is a vector space. A vector spaces can be divided by real numbers. So now this whole expression is an element of G. So we've proven that this is an element of G, but we also know that this equals that. Ergo, this is an element of G. Now there is one subtlety, right? This is a limit, right? So I'm taking a limit here. So you could ask the question, it would be a fair question to ask, well, wait a minute, I know that the, the difference between this and this is in G, but I don't know that the limit will be in G, right? I can subtract two vectors and divide them, but I don't know if the vector that's left over after this limiting procedure is inside the vector space, right? So the argument there is that when you have a finite dimensional vector space, it is closed. A finite dimensional vector space is complete, not closed, it's complete. So I'll write that down. A finite dimensional vector space is complete, which means that any uh, Cauchy sequence of vectors will limit to a vector that's actually in the space. Now, in order to understand Cauchy sequences, you kind of have to have a norm on the vector space. Um, so not a lot of this will make total sense unless you have a norm defined. But using the normal elements of topology, this fact, which I'm not going to prove here uh, or work with here, I'm not going to go through f the functional analysis to actually put a norm on our vector space. Although we will, we will eventually put an inner product, which will give us a norm on our, on our Lie algebra. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that this limit, the fact that this is a limit, is not really a problem. Uh, the limit will also be a vector, uh, as long as the, every piece of the numerator is a vector. So we have now proven that this commutator of two elements of our, of our Lie vector space, our vector space spanned by the generators, we now know that xi, xj minus xj, xi is also an element of G. All right, proven beyond a doubt happens right, right here forever. So the reason that's important is for the sort of the final stroke here, which is that if I took any two elements, any two elements inside G, if I took uh, element W and element Z, well, what have I got? I've got the commutator between W and Z is going to equal uh, alpha mu x mu, beta nu x nu, right? Which is going to be uh, alpha uh, mu beta nu x mu x nu, right? And I know that this, this is just going to be another uh, vector, another uh, element of this commutator is going to exist inside, so I know I know that this thing is going to have uh, it's going to be real. So, I mean, it's going to be a member of this of the uh, of the vector space. So, anytime I take the commutator of any two elements, I always will have another element in that space. So now I have the power to define an algebra, right? Because inside this vector space, I have the addition. I have scalar multiplication. Um, we're using the field of, of, of either real or complex numbers in our vector space, but you know, real for a lot of physics. Well, complex for quantum mechanics, real for general relativity in physics. But we have uh, addition and scalar multiplication. And now we have group multiplication. Right? I can say group element W with group multiplication Z is defined by the commutator of W and Z, right? And that exists also. And furthermore, this group multiplication is linear over the addition, which means W with respect to, say, Z plus S is going to equal W with Z 
which will be a vector, right, because it's just the commutator of w and z, plus w and s, which would be the equivalent, I guess, of writing w z plus w s, right? So that's what it takes to be an algebra. That's all it takes. It takes a vector space, which is just this stuff, and then you need to define a group multiplication. Now, we didn't have a group multiplication before, but the group multiplication actually appeared. It was forced upon us. It was forced upon us by our understanding that these guys here are infinitesimal movements inside the actual group. And once we had that, that gave us this. And when, that, when it gives us this, that tells us that the commutator of the group has to be described by uh, um, has to be described by a commutator, well, right here, uh, a, co a, a, a commutator inside the Lie algebra, the algebra of the Lie group. And we showed that, hey, good news, that commutator of the Lie algebra, you know what? It's also a member of the group. That's what all this stuff showed. This guy is actually a member, not of the group, this guy is a member of the Lie algebra too. Therefore, uh, we now have a way of multiplying uh, two, two um, members of the Lie of this vector space, and now we promote it from a vector space to an algebra. And it's an algebra because it has these algebraic properties, the properties of a vector space, right? And this includes, of course, it, it has a zero, and every element has an inverse element, right? So an inverse, inverse element under addition. Now notice there's no rules for inverse elements under the group multiplication. The only thing we need to about group multiplication is closure, right? We need to know that this is an element of the algebra that's got to be closed, and it's got to be linear over the vector addition, right? Those are the two properties we need to be in algebra. So there's no unit, there's no requirement that there be a unit uh, under this multiplication, although, you know, but for example, yeah, I mean, if you looked at, you know, I, Z, right, what do you get? You get, um, well, you get i z minus z i, which is zero. I commutes with everything, so you're going to get zero. But you're not going to get something that like returns i, right? So this whole notion of of uh, so you don't worry too much about all the other properties you might expect for multiplication. All you need is linearity over the addition and closure. Okay, so what we've done today is we have promoted our vector space spanned by the generators that were calculated using this formula, given a matrix representation of the group, calculated the generators, those generators made a vector space. And now we have shown that this vector space has a multiplication property, xi, xj, and that that is also in the group. <clears throat> All right, so in our next lecture, we'll go through this summary again. Uh, I think every time I go through this summary, I, I make it a little bit clearer. But now we don't have to fool around with calling this some kind of vector space spanned by the generators, which were calculated through this method. We can now talk about it as what it is, which is a Lie algebra. Right? We can call that a Lie algebra. And of course, this is a Lie group. And now we know the relationship between the two, right? We know that any element of the Lie algebra raised to some power is an element of the Lie group, and any element of the Lie group whose derivative is taken with respect to one of the um, parameters is an element of the Lie algebra when, I guess, all the parameters are set to zero, right? So we know how this kind of works. So we'll go through that again, and then we will discuss the structure constants of the Lie algebra. And we're really going to start studying this guy. And then uh, we have a lot of examples to do. There's a bunch of chapters. I mean, it's a pretty slow slosh the way Gilmore handles it, but I'm in no hurry. So I'll, I'll see you next time.